The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the Eastern Shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. Enjoy the show. I met a woman at uh, the St. Michael's Art League annual show they have in St. Michael's, and um, I know a lot of the artists there, so I was visiting, and, and this woman was really looking at this painting, and she looked at me and she went, is this any good? And I said, do you like it? She said, yeah, I really do. I said, do you think you'll like it next year? She's like, oh yeah. I said, well then... <laughs> right. Good. Welcome to Plenary Easton Podcast. I'm Tim Wagon. Hey, I'm Jess Bellis. Welcome. And today we are talking with Nanny Tripp of the Tripp Gallery here in Easton. Uh, Jess, why'd we uh, pick her? Well, I, I think we had a great conversation with her. I think, it, you know, she's got such cool perspective about sort of owning a gallery, how to get into a gallery, and she's doing, she's sort of providing a new service to some of her collectors where she's coming in and curating people's art collections in their home. I just think it's so cool. Yeah, and I I think that uh, she kind of started the gallery out of, it just sort of happened for her. It wasn't really something that she had planned, although she was an art history major, a photographer who loved photography her whole life, and the story's kind of cool, and she really, has a lot of experience. Yeah, no, I think that she's both a, a smart lady and she's had a lot of great experience and she certainly knows plein air painting and art. But I thought it, I thought it was an interesting conversation. I guess one of my takeaways when we were talking to Marie after we wrapped talking to her is, you know, how different art looks in your space over time. You know, I, I think about when I've rearranged art in my, my own house, how it takes on a whole new life. And I, I think it would be so interesting to have someone else come into your house and rearrange it. It probably would, they, they would probably choose things that you would never even think to do yourself. Right, and that's where she really came off as kind of an expert, is knowing what, the, you know, what we had been doing this for so long and decorating a gallery, which helped her out a lot, as I think she, she mentioned. I'm not sure you decorate a gallery. Do you right. curate a gallery? Curate a gallery, see? I mean, it's... I don't know. Maybe you do decorate it. Too bad. Too bad she's gone. And we can't ask her. But I hope everybody enjoys this conversation with our dear friend Nanny Tripp from the Tripp Gallery in Easton, Maryland. Here we go. Peter Piper Pet. This, this really stops. This That's stops how we're that. going to start Peter our Piper interview Pet. with Peter with 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 um, tongue twisters. <laughs> Testing. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Man, welcome to the Planner Easton podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Awesome. Um, so we have known um, Nanny Tripp for many years. She is a, a great patron of downtown Easton, a great supporter of Plenary Easton, and she owns a gallery. Nanny, how did that happen to you? Well, it started... It started as a sort of a single artist with a group of other artists who had kind of a co-op on Harrison Street above uh, what is now Barriers. And then another artist and I broke off and had our own studio space, which has now morphed into the Trip Gallery in a really great space in downtown Easton. Well, I, I know, uh, Nay, that that's <coughs> true. Um, and, and But uh, I'd like to go back just a little bit further in that how did you decide to do a gallery? Because I knew you as parent of children who used to bring in to do acting and things like that in the camps, and the, and then all of a sudden, I had I had no idea that you even you, you know I didn't know your background. I just knew you from from your children, and then all of a sudden you had a gallery. How did how did that decision come about? Um, I think it it mainly uh, happened. Don Hildebrandt and I had our studio space together, and we started hosting a few uh, local artists. We had a special show for our friend Ellen Gavin, who was a plein air painter for many years. Uh, we hosted a show for Jill Basham when her career was just starting. And the space where we were wasn't really conducive to walk in traffic. And the space across the street opened up, and it was a m- larger space. And we thought, well, great, we can bring in more artists. Um, 
John moved out west and said, I don't really want to be in the gallery business. And for me, it just kind of blossomed from there. I had gotten to know so many artists through being in downtown Easton, the co-op I was in, getting involved in Plein Air Easton, and it just took off on its own. So let's take a big step back. <clears throat> Have you always considered yourself an artist from when you were small, or is it something that kind of has evolved over time? Um, I think it's evolved over time. I've always enjoyed photography. I've been taking pictures ever since I was a little kid. My father built a dark room. Uh, for me in the That's basement awesome. of the house. So that was kind of what I did, was I'd be in there all night. Right. I lived out in the country, and most of my time was spent outdoors in the woods, um, hence my love of trees, uh, with my pets, riding horses. So that was really what my eye was captured by. And did you go off and have formal training? Um, sort of. I mean, I took a few courses in high school and throughout college. Um, but as far as really one-on-one -on -one studying with someone in particular, doing a lot of workshops, not really. Self-taught. And have you always collected art? Do you come from a family that has, a, has had a robust art collection or has like your, your, your evolution into both owning a gallery and really, I mean, I feel like Nanny knows all the representational artists <laughs> at this point. Um, you know, how, how, did, how did that, did that did, was that always there or did that evolve? Well, it's interesting because I have a lot of um, historic art in my house that was done in the 1800s of ancestors that's quite beautiful. Like portraits? Portraits. And then really during uh, when the Waterfowl Festival started, I was a teenager and I remember my parents would go and my fa every year my father would buy a piece. It was either a painting or a piece of sculpture. So that's when I really started to see that they were collecting did that things. Did that, was that motivation with your father, do you feel like that that was born of supporting the event and the community or a real love of the art itself or a combination of both? I think it was a combination of both because um, being from here and being interested in conservation, that's what draws you in to begin with. And I think you get in and you're like, wow, this is really beautiful. I'd love to have this in my house. Or I have a special bird carving that he bought and he gave to my mother one year um, that I really treasure. Right. Right. And, and you've been going to the Waterfowl Festival for your whole life, you said, here. Um, just real curious, and I don't want to uh, go too off, off a too uh, divergent track, but when you say the bird carving, one of the things that people talk about with the Waterfowl Festival is um, how you know they can get sculptures of lions and tigers and all kinds of wildlife. Is it always does that festival always sort of had lions and tigers in it, or has it grown in, into into that as it, over the years? I think it's grown more into that. I mean, it was so small in the beginning, and then you go through the period where you don't really attend because it's so difficult to get into town <laughs> and um, and then I've sort of circled back and started going again and I remember that was my one reaction when I came back to it was wow lions and tigers this is new and different so it, it didn't start out that way it was all ducks and geese and I want to go back to the notion of like art and conservation, which is something that I didn't think we'd touch on, but I would touch on it briefly. Do you think that art can serve a role in conservation? Do you think that an event like Plein Air Easton does? Um, that's an interesting concept. Um, I don't know. I mean, I hadn't really paired that with Plein Air Easton, but that would be really good food for thought and discussion. Well, I think certainly some of our, you know, as, as we've connected with the agricultural community or like when we had our Vanishing Landscape Award, we've certainly had sponsors who have been interested in that narrative. And I think, you know, the, the notion of being able to stop and really take in the beauty of the landscape you see every day, art kind of helps you do that. And so whether it makes you appreciate that landscape more and act in respectful ways, I guess this is kind of some, sometimes how I think about it. Does that make sense? Well, I think, no, I think there's a great, there's a great potential. When they started the, um, the paint out at the vineyard and on a farm, I thought, wow, this is so wonderful. What a wonderful addition to the event to really bring attention and to start a collection that is um, dedicated to agriculture, which is so important to our area, our, our community. Let's go back to, so you found yourself 
um, Don Hildebrand has moved away and you're like, oh my gosh, this is not even really a studio. It is not a co-op. This is like a straight up gallery and it is now exploding with artists. Tell me like, what are some of the surprises that you have? Like, what are, what are some of your takeaways when you sort of looked around and you were like, I found myself here. I didn't expect it to be blank. Like how, what are some of the ways you might finish that conversation? Well, I think it, it started with um, being able to circle back with the artists that were part of that co-op to begin with, some local artists that I think are incredibly talented. And it's just morphed into, I think it started, I think David Shant, who was probably the first Plain Air Easton artist that I invited to participate because I loved his paintings. And I remember at the quick coming up to him at the quick draw and he was standing next to his easel and I said, would you consider being a part of my gallery and leaving me a few paintings? And he just was so excited and it really took off from there. So I got through the hurdle of asking that first artist. Did that feel, because what, I hadn't were you nervous? Like, did you yet. sit at home and say, am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? Or was it just kind of a more spontaneous no, thing? No, it was very spontaneous. You were really of, nervous about it. You were nervous. Well, I was nervous about it because I had no name I, and and was still learning a lot about the whole planet. And, and I don't know anything about that. That is what, just why I'm asking. It's a, it's a nerve wracking sort of situation to ask an artist to, when you first start out. Um, it was, but it was, he made, Dave made it so easy. He was like, oh, heck <laughs> there yeah. There you go, Dave. Heck yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'll be in. I'm in. Count me in. But Tim, you could see how it would be nervous. It's like it's like asking somebody out on a date, right? Or like to go steady or something, <laughs> right? Like, that, not like that, but like, you know, you, you, you don't want rejection. Well, that's kind of what I'm asking. Is that, that, is that what, it's, what it's like in, in that, uh, you know, it would seem to me like if, if I were an artist, it would be kind of an honor. But I, I do know that when people have asked us, hey, what, 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 tell me about this gallery. You know, they asked me to be, so I was just curious about that relationship. I just said, even how, how and how, are you, is Dave still in your, in, in your uh, shop? Oh yeah. Dave will always be in the gallery and he's. Dave, do you hear that? You have a permanent <laughs> gig here in Easton with Manny. <laughs> as long as he comes every year and does a demo that pulls people in like crazy because he's he's so good at explaining his art and sharing it. But I think this is like an interesting segue to sort of the next part of the conversation is is one of the reasons why if you're if you are a new gallery owner and you start like inviting people that you respect to show your work, you are feeling nervous because you're like those people th- these artists might be out of my league. That's maybe like one thing that that, that somebody right. might think. And then if your gallery is successful to the point where yours is now, like it's not you you're not so much the asker as everybody is coming to you to, you're the one who can play hard to get now right like it's a, it's like a kind of a, a paradigm shift that happens with right. success well, right that's why i now have 41 artists that i represent in the gallery when we sat there and counted them up the other day i was absolutely astonished because i think i started with eight nine ten and now i have 41 and it's very difficult to say no to somebody because I know how important it is to get your art there in front of the public, especially in an area like Easton that has become very art-centric um, in not only the state of Maryland, but all up and down the East Coast and all over. Right. You want to be represented in a gallery in Easton. That makes sense to me. And, and the, the part of the equation is, is that you sell these these artists' work a, a, over the course of a year or however long they're in the gallery. Right, right. And a lot of it is is good um, publication. We've got great publications here that will do press releases, advertising. I advertise all over. Um, I also offer the feature of being able to curate art for your home so that if you have a new home or you're new to the area and you're like, well, I want some art, but I don't have time to go shop, I will bring it to you. You choose what you like, or if you like a certain artist, I'll get them to paint commissions. I know. So I, there's a lot there's more to it. There's a full service it. side to it. There's yeah, a full service side. There's more to it than just having a gallery and waiting for people to come in and go, oh, I like this. I so want to get into that, but I, well, I guess I have two comments before I, I would move to that. One is, Tim, how big do you think Nanny Tripp's gallery is? For people who haven't walked in there before, she's sitting here and she's saying, I represent 42 artists. Like, this is not a large space. Can you equate it to something? I get because not everybody's been in there. Everyone should go in there. But like, if you were like, if 
I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I would equate, equate it to like an eighth of the size of Trader Joe's average size uh, place. <laughs> I, I know. I was like, is it like the size of a, of a gap at the mall? <laughs> right. Like what? Like what? <laughs> Probably something like you have know, five eighths the size of a gap at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> five eighths. That would be super tiny. Now, now I'm not sure yeah. people are believing us. No, no, no. Um, but it's, so, it's, it's a. It's just. It's a beautiful space because there's a lot of natural light. It is well, a, a lot really, of natural light. A lot it, of natural it, it, light, it, and there's plenty of room to be able to stand back and see the paintings and sit in the salon and enjoy it and see yep. what it would feel like in your own home. You, cr- you create a really welcoming environment, too, I think. Um, so you, you said it's really hard to tell people no, but I know because I've sat in that salon that you do have to tell people no, uh, like almost on a daily basis. So I guess my question to you now would be, if I am an artist who is at that tipping point, who wants, who believes I'm really ready for gallery representation, how are people successful when they do approach you? I mean, I know that you're out there, you know, looking at, at places like Plenary Easton, or you've been to Plenary Texas, and you, you've got your eye on people that speak to you or that you like that you might be continuing to court into your gallery, but you must find some that come to you and say, this is my body of work. Do you like it? Like, what are successful moves that those people make with you? Or what kind of advice might you have to somebody who is interested in in, in getting gallery well, it's, representation? It's really interesting because I'm a visual learner, so I have to almost see the artwork um, in person to be able to say, yes, I love this, this is technically really good, or this speaks to me, or I know this will speak to people here. Um, but you don't <clears throat> want people showing up with their big bag of paintings no, un- uninvited on your doorstep. Like, that's probably not a good, uh, not good advice. That's why most, pretty much every artist that's in the gallery is by invitation. I have sought them out. I've seen their work. I have one artist, there's only one artist I have that I've never met. He sent me his work. And I just knew that it was incredible. And he's the only one that I took on. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, like, would you say that the best way for an artist, especially someone who, who paints in plein air, to, to get noticed is to buy, is by participating in competitions like plein air East? Absolutely. you got to get, get your face in the place somewhere else before you can start knocking on the doors or, or sending emails to galleries. Yeah, I think it's really, I think it's really, for me, it's important to have that personal connection with the artist. What's your best day that you've had in, in a gallery, uh, Nanny? Like, obviously, there have been days when you have sold probably a high dollar value worth of artwork. But are there other days where you haven't sold much and just been like, through customer interactions, people coming in, talking about the work that you've collected, have you said to yourself, man, that was a really good day? It's it's completely random, completely random. I sold a very large painting of David Grafton's in the middle of a snowstorm in March a few years ago. And then you might sit there for a half of September and have very low volume of people walking down the street. Um, January has already been very good, which is unusual. February is usually the time that you can go to Florida or go travel. Or <laughs> like that, traditionally, but the rest of the year has been really steady. Obviously, July with the traffic from Plein Air Easton, November with waterfowl, but it's been it's pretty steady from April on. But a- so and anything beyond the sales that has just thrilled you with be, be turning into sort of a art gallery owner unbeknownst to yourself even at the time. I think the thing that uh, I respond to the most that gets me the most excited is just seeing people come in for the first time and they look around them and they're like, wow, there's really beautiful pieces in here. You're like, and just yeah, there seeing, is. <laughs> and seeing them relate to each piece and then watching a couple go, one go this way, one go that way, and then they come together and go, I really like this, you know, or I really like this. And it's exciting to hear the discourse between people of what they respond to. So let's talk about that. Like, how do people collect art? Like, it is kind of like that. Right? They're like, this moves me. I'm looking for something like X. I mean, tell me, is, is there like a, when someone walks in the door and you sort of not size them up, but how, what, what is, we, we talked about how, how, how do you find yourself to be a gallery owner? We've talked a little bit about how do you find yourself as a, in a gallery represented. How do you find yourself collecting art? Like, what do people do? 
Well, it's interesting because everybody's motivation is a little different. Sometimes someone will walk in and they do have a specific place in mind in their home that they're looking for something. And other times it's just like, oh my gosh, I have to have this painting. This is really speaking to me. I'll find the place. I, depending on, I, I try to let people look. And then when I'm engaging with them at the end, finding out where they're from, if they're looking for anything in particular, explaining that we can do commissions or photography can make any size. And then I love the old game of, so if you had to pick one, which one would it be? Right. And it really makes them stop and think about what they just looked at. Right. And if they had to make a choice, what would it be? And I love getting that kind of feedback and having that conversation. I bet that that's really exciting. I've, I've certainly experienced small versions of that during our festival when I'm w- showing people around the Well, and then they're going to think there. about that painting. Yep, it's, it makes the impression. Right. I think that that's really good. So you, so you told us a little bit about how you have helped people sort of curate an entire home, and I'm so interested in how that process what, what, what does that process look like? Like if somebody was like, Nanny, I don't even know what my taste is. I bought this big new house. Like, h- help me make it look good. Is that what they would say? Like what? Pretty much. I mean, what I Or would... I feel like it's a hodgepodge mess <clears throat> right now. Can you come help me, like, make it look a little bit more cohesive? I, I don't even, I don't know how to hang a painting. I mean, I... I... Well, that's just it. So I... Fortunately, I mean, it's great if somebody can come to the gallery first and I see what artists they respond to. Then I'll load up a U-Haul with all sorts of different art and I'll bring it to the house and they can see what looks great in what room, what style they like in the dining room versus what they want in their family room. And you sort of mix and match. And then I have... um, a professional hanger that works right alongside of me and we figure out where things are going to go and he follows right along and hangs it and off you go. It's just such a cool concept. I mean, everybody wants things delivered. Nobody has a lot of time to go shopping. So why not have it brought to your home so you can actually see what it looks like on site in your light. Did did um, <clears throat> designing your own gallery help you to build your confidence in being able to go into people's homes and do that type of thing? Um, I think so. I mean, I have sold real estate for 30 years, so I am good at having those kinds of conversations and helping people make decisions and understanding their motivation on what they like and what they don't like and what appeals to them. So, and having been a lover of art my whole life, I mean, I'm an art history major, so it's, it's sort of hand in hand. It's become very natural for me to be able to do it, and that's what's really exciting about it. Is it, like, I guess I'm into, like, is it color? Is it composition? Is it, you know, when you're looking at these blank camp, when you're when you're loading up the U-Haul, I mean, you're thinking about the different rooms and, and paintings that maybe group well together. You hopefully have a sense of the, the buyer's style, but is there anything that you would say to artists about painting saleable artwork? Or, you know, like, do you feel like there's a common thread amongst paintings that get sold over ones that don't? Or is it really just totally in the eye of the beholder? It's really in the eye of the beholder. It can be anything. It can be anything. It can be completely abstract, completely impressionistic, or it can be a typical Eastern Shore landscape. And it depends on the setting. And what people are looking for and the lighting and that sort of thing. And a color and so forth and so on, size. So it's like a puzzle. It's really fun to piece it together. No, again, I think that that sounds so exciting. If somebody is sort of looking looking at a new room, you've just put a fresh coat of paint on it and you know your kid's finally gone to college and you're reclaiming the space and you're like, all right, I'm ready. What is some advice that you might give to them? As far as choosing yeah, your Yeah, like where do, you, where do you start? <clears throat> like what do you do? You're looking at a blank slate. Well, I think the important thing First is First you come to, talk to you, right? Come you come, to come, 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 to, come to Trip Gallery. You come, into, trip. you come into the gallery and you go, wow, I really like these paintings by Jill Basham or I really like these paintings by John Sills. Do you have other of his work you can show me? And that's when you either pull out their portfolio or you get them on the phone and say, look, I'm doing this room for this family and they want they something love your style, that's right. 36 by 42 in this sort of style and these kind of colors. And these guys are pros. They they will produce. And 
I've never had anybody say, no, I don't want this. They love it immediately once you get it in place. Well, in part two, because they, like, then the buyer has some ownership, like, they feel vested in the product as well, right? Right, exactly. Or the piece, not the product, the piece of artwork. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm just sort of, you know, with your background uh, in art history and you've loved art your whole life and, uh, you know, selling the real estate um, gave you confidence looking in rooms, you know, but how do you know when, as a lay person sitting here, you know, I just redecorated my house and it's, I can tell you, you can't really out in there, the, the radio world or blog world or video log, whatever we're on here, these <laughs> blog, you can't really get like it. It, you can't picture it looks terrible it does not look <laughs> terrible I've been in his house his house does it, not look it's ter- terrible I would say it's eclectic no, it's definitely yeah, I mean it's all I put I, I, I couldn't figure out which walls to put them on so I put all the paintings together and then I'm like you know and just sort of space them in, in like almost like a Tetris style sort of like thing on one wall because I only have one big wall it looks horrendous it does so, not so I, I'm just curious as to like that confidence that you're like that's that's right that's what, well like, hanging it's, hanging is an art in itself and having been doing this for 10 years rehanging my studio or my gallery every month with a new show mm-hmm. i learned a lot from don hildebrandt like i would never put i would always put the small painting on top and small you know, painting on top so instead he was hanging the larger painting on top which looks proportionately better nine times out of ten so so I've been painting a large playing. painting no. on top. I've, yeah. been, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've had a lot of practice at hanging, and I it comes really easy to me now. What about something off centered? If you don't want it all centered correctly, exactly, how do you? Well, get, then you would might have one above, two below, two above, one below, a vertical and a horizontal. It just you have to. It helps to lay it out on the Wait, floor. Wait, Tim, what versus. she's saying is it is like Tetris. Right. <laughs> You can hire me to come over and I'll help you sort it out. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that, that's exactly it. I mean, I get, do you want to talk about your services at all in terms of that? Or how, how does someone go about it? I mean, that's what we can do. We can, we can come over and say, no, you should be hanging it this way and switch it all around. That's part of what we're able to offer is being able to hang the art professionally in your, your own home. Yeah, that sounds – that's great because, uh, you know, when you touched on um, – how do people find out who they're going to collect and who you know what pieces of art they're going to pick? I made a decision years and years and years ago that I was only going to collect people that I actually knew because right. there was so much art that I liked that I'd end up just wanting to spend money on it even though I didn't have it. So this is kind of limited. I, unless I knew you, I wouldn't wouldn't buy one of your paintings. But that does lead to an eclectic sort of style of paintings because it's a you know it's seven or eight different people that you're, you're kind of collecting that are from different well that's pretty much the way i've been collecting is i have a relationship with the artist or i've met the artist and so you have that connection which i think makes the art mean that much more when you enjoy it in your house um the other thing that's really fun about being in the gallery business is um is uh what's the word i'm looking for is discovering new talent like the artists that you're going to have here for your cocktails and conversation um stephen haynes in particular was smart enough to come to easton prior to plan air easton it was the first event i think he'd even applied to so lucky so and talented not luck work he he was smart enough to come to easton a couple of weeks early to get the lay of the land, figure out where you could paint, get to know some local people. And his, so we established a friendship before I'd ever seen one of his paintings. And when I finally saw his paintings, I was like, wow, he's really good. This is really fun. Um, and he did very well at the event and he's done very well at the gallery. Now I, I, I too, like get so much more joy out of pieces where I know the artist and I know where it's that's why I love plein air Easton too like I, that's why I love these competitions is you know you you can say oh yeah no that is that is of Oxford like when people come over to your house I think that that feels kind of special well I had too. to take my house off the list because 
there were so many painters coming out to paint that I felt I had to buy every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it's terrible. A cautionary <laughs> tale to those getting on our private properties <laughs> list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's terrific. Um, you know, Nanny Tripp's Gallery is, is located here in downtown Easton on, on Harrison Street. It is a fabulous place. You're open year-round. You don't really go to Florida. She That was sort of a joke. Um, <laughs> she's there almost all the time. And, um, man, I would love for her to show up with a U-Haul of art at my house if I had, well, except for I don't have any wall space. So I would have to have a new house and then have you there show you up go. with your there U-Haul. You um, but I think that that sounds really fun, too. Yeah, I think that having uh, Nanny come over and talk about that would be great for anybody who, um, you know, because it's, it's, it can be hard for people. Even though you feel like you, you know, you want this and you want the room to look a certain way, it's hard to get it exactly what they want. So getting a second opinion and somebody with your background would be great to have in there. Well, I guess the only other thing that I would say, too, is I think that there are people who don't have a lot of original artwork and there's such a such a like you want to buy something that is valuable like you don't like I think that there's there's like there becomes like a mind game between like do I like it and is it good enough like whatever good enough right. means like is this investment worthy or is this you know I think that that keeps people from collecting artwork they, they're like yeah but this is this is three thousand dollars Tim three thousand dollars is a lot of money but like you've said if you have it your entire life it be, if it becomes the treasured piece of art right. that that is passed down to generations because it's meaningful then three thousand dollars isn't that much money it I, really I, isn't. I yeah, mean, I, I met a woman at uh, the St. Michael's Art League annual show they have in St. Michael's, and um, I know a lot of the artists there, so I was visiting, and, and this woman was really looking at this painting, and she looked at me, and she went, is this any good? And I said, <laughs> do you like it? She said, yeah, I really do. I said, do you think you'll like it next year? She's like, oh, yeah. I said, well, then... <laughs> right, it's good. That's right. That's that yeah. good. And she bought it and went home and was delighted. I mean, and that's the fun thing about the gallery too is I want to have something in there for everybody. It's not just all oil paintings. It's oils. It's watercolors. It's photography. It's sculpture. It's etchings. So there's something in there at all levels of collecting, which is also it's really fun to get somebody excited about beginning their collection, and also the discerning collector who has a good collection but finds that one little piece that adds to it. No, it's so different. And you, we talked about this, you and I, the other day. Your your tastes change so much. Like, some of the pieces that I bought early on when I started collecting, I look at and I'm like, meh, what was I really thinking? Like, I think I was driven more by content than quality right out of the gate. I was moved by, like, the, the location or, you know, maybe the person was super nice and, like, the, <laughs> it really wasn't as good. And, you know, the same is also true that I have pieces that I bought at that very first year that still remain some of my favorite pieces that I've like grown to like them and appreciate them more so it's an interesting like evolution as you are a collector just how you look at the same pieces mm -hmm. over time well there's the memory of where you got it too and that somebody else was also looking at it and you were like if I walk around the corner they're going to red dot it before I do so it's mine <laughs> I'm taking it now <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, if you, you know, just from a practical standpoint, the stuff that is in my house that, uh, you know, has I've either helped purchase or or been a part of the purchase. I I mean, if you put it in a good spot, you see it every day. And and I think if you can just say to yourself, man, I really like looking at that every day. And, and I I can see myself moving this in the, into the next house that I moved into. I mean, it's well worth whatever whatever you're paying for it, I, I think. Daily Joy, I've got a Stephen Griffin painting that for th through three different houses has stayed on the wall that like is uh, across from my where my lay head lays on the pillow. And I wake up every day and I'm like, oh, there's my water view. And uh, trust me, guys, I have never had a water view. I probably will never have a water view. But every morning I like look out over my quote unquote water. It's a tiny little painting, too. It's not a big one. But every day it makes me smile. You know, sure, I see that water view. And as I always like to say, that car that you bought the same year for $40,000 is, is gone after five years. <laughs> right, exactly. So, like, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> it, that, it's just a practical way to look at it. And um, we're very lucky to have uh, people like you, Danny, the Plein Air Easton Festival around here to expose people to that because I don't think I would have ever learned it if I, if I hadn't been, been, been able to be around it. Nanny, you said you were nervous about talking to us. Was this okay? This was great. <laughs>
we're not that scary. You would encourage other people to maybe come and say hello to us, talk to and us. I, and I dressed up and everything. <laughs> she looks beautiful, guys. She really does. She looks ten times better than Tim and I today. <laughs> she always has. <laughs> not in my case. Uh, Nanny, where is your uh, 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 gallery located and are you online? That sort yes. of thing. Yes. Uh, 23 North Harrison Street, so across from the backside of the Tidewater Inn and uh, the tripgallery.com. It's the website. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks Thank you very much. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by David Hillowitz. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com.